few years ago, my wife and I saw a play slash musical over in uh, Macon called Every Christmas Story Ever Told. And it begins, these three guys are going to do uh, the, the Christmas Carol. You know, the Christmas Carol, Scrooge, Bah Humbug, all of that. And uh, as they start with the Christmas Carol, they start into those well-worn words. One of them looks at the rest and says, you know, I, I, I can't do this. I've done this every year, every Christmas, for the last 20, 30 years, I'm fried. I cannot do this. We all know how this goes. Bah humbug, nice goes, fat goes, scary goes, God bless us, everyone. Right? That, that, that's, we all know how this, this is going to unfold. And, and, um, and that seems to, and, and then they all kind of go off the rails from there. It's a rather amusing musical. But uh, I was reading the story of David again, and the story of David goes from 1 Samuel 16 all the way through the rest of 1 Samuel, all the way through 2 Samuel into 1 Kings. And I was having uh, this moment thinking that this similarity of this moment, because this is this really long story. The story of King David is the longest continuous story we have in Scripture. It, uh, it, it is, and we know everything, I mean, we are told the entirety of David's story from the time he is a teen until he dies. And we don't have that about anyone else in Scripture as far as I know. And yet, it is off, the way that uh, David's story is often uh, told is, is reduced, like the way that we can reduce uh, Christmas Carol to Bah Humbug, Nice Ghost, Fast Ghost, Scary Ghost, God, God bless us everyone. Right? We can do the same thing with David. Like, if I asked you what's the story of David, you'd say... David and uh, Goliath, right? And then he becomes king, and then he has this thing with Bathsheba, then he hands off to Solomon, and we're done, right? That, that's, what, do you know much more about David's life beyond that? Uses a slingshot, becomes king, sleeps with Bathsheba, moves along. And, and that isn't enough. Because like, what we're looking at... We've been looking at the way that, that covenants work, like the covenant that God says, receive this and live. And so we've gone from uh, Noah, with all of humanity, looks up at the rainbow, receive this covenant, this promise, and live. And then we get a little bit more specific, and we get to Abraham, receive this land, and live on this land. And last week we got to, to Moses, and Moses has received this law, and live in this specific way on the land. And now we get to David, and with David we're looking at how, how does one one person live a life trusting in, in this promise that God gives uh, to David. Receive this gift to, to David. You will be king, and, and then your children after you will be king. And, and I cannot think of a way to tell you the story of David and how he lives his life in response to this promise other than telling you the life of David and how he lives his life in response to this promise. And so, I'm going to tell you the story of the life of David today. I've never done this before. This is an experiment. We shall see at the end of this whether it was a successful one. And so, we start with, uh, start with David. Samuel starts in... Uh, 1 Samuel 16. Samuel was the last of the judges and the first of the prophets, and after Saul, uh, it's clear that Saul will not be king into perpetuity. Uh, God sends him out to select the next king. And he goes to uh, Jesse, and Jesse has eight sons, seven of them are before him, and one son is the youngest, and he's such a bum that he has him out tending sheep, and, and he's the one we're not worried about. This is the kid... Okay, everyone, we're going to church, except for you. You stay and do the dishes. Like, that's the kid he, he, who's not there. And so Samuel looks at all of these, one by one, and says, no, I want the last one, the one that you didn't bother to bring. That's the one I'm going to choose. And so the Spirit of God is upon David. He is the one who's anointed, and he's about 13, 14 years old, young guy. And so... At this time, Saul, because he knows that things aren't going to go all that well for him, begins to lapse into depression. Saul is the king, uh, and so the king starts lapsing into depression, and his servants say, we need to find someone to help the king pep up, and so let's find someone who's good at playing music. And one of them knows of David. you got to do something while you're watching sheep forever, so he, he had learned to play the harp. Small harp, lyre type of thing. And so he goes and he gets David, and David is, sing is singing and playing for the king, so the king King can relax. In those days, this is, this is when the Philistines invaded. The Philistines invade 
And when the Philistines invade, they're all, they take position on one side of a valley, and the army of Israel is on the other side of the valley, and there's this valley in between. And here's your quick briefing on uh, old tactics of that day. The first one to charge loses, because then the other one can charge down on top of them, and then they'd have the height advantage. So you can't be the one to charge first in that situation. And so they just spend day after day staring at each other and, and trying to make sure they can keep feeding your army, because feeding an army is hard. And so each day, Goliath stepped out from the Philistines and said, y'all, anyone here man enough to take me on? And, and this is where David steps forward and he says, I, I, I can do this. And, and this is where David runs down, has his uh, moment of insane courage and uses his slingshot. Like, never confuse a slingshot for a, a, to a toy. A slingshot can throw a stone with the force of a 9 millimeter. Like, when it says that the, the stone sank into uh, Goliath's head, that's, that's literally like he got shot in the head and he went down. And so David takes him out. And, and this is the point at which they say, well, it looks like the lad has some, some skill in the military arts. Let, let's get him involved in the army. And so uh, David becomes part of the king's military, gets to know the king's son, Jonathan, and da David begins to really excel, such that uh, Saul begins to worry about him. He's the upcoming hero. And then and the next time David is playing for Saul, Saul takes a spear, looks at him and says, he's going to be a problem, and chucks the spear at him. David dodges, and he leaves. This is the first time Saul throws a spear. You might want to keep track. He does it fairly often. At this point, Saul wants to get rid of David, and so Saul looks at David and makes him an offer he can't refuse. He says, I have this daughter of mine. She would love to marry a beautiful woman. Why don't you go as a bride price? Why don't you prove that you can kill a hundred Philistines? Thinking to himself, if you fight a hundred people, one of them's going to kill him. And so he goes and, and he kills a hundred Philistines and brings back a hundred Philistine foreskins to prove it, because that, well, I guess, was the easiest way to do that. And um, brings back a hundred Philistine foreskins. And at this point, Saul's like, he's doomed. Because Saul has gone from having this guy he's worried there's going to be a problem for him, and now he's a son in law. Ugh. <laughs> Family meals must, must have been tense. And so David continues to grow and mature. And Saul makes it publicly known that I would like to kill David. But he starts telling people, like, I want to get rid of him. And, and his dad, has, and Jonathan, they, uh, Saul's son, has to go and like, talk him down to say, you know what, he's, he's kind of in charge of our army. This would be a really bad idea. And Saul starts to get unstable, equivocating. And Jonathan tells David... Um, you, you probably just, you need to watch yourself so that next time David goes to play for Saul again, Saul throws another spear at him. And at this point, David stops playing for Saul. He's done. They throw one spear, uh, two spears, we're done. And, and so at this point, Saul uh, is going to, he wants to kill David in his sleep. And so uh, David's at home. He realizes he needs to get out of Dodge. And so his wife stuffs pillows into a bed so that she can keep on saying, yeah, David, he's just sick. And he runs. And that saves his life, his wife stuffing pillows into a bed. Yeah, he's right there. He, he just got a cold. It just, you know, so she could deny people entrance into the house. And, and so David runs. And David asks Jonathan, what have I done to deserve this? What's my crime? And Jonathan says, you're square. You're fine. Uh, and Jonathan assures him that the two of them will get along. And Jonathan goes to check on this with his father, see what he's thinking. And at this point, Jonathan makes this covenant with David that they will protect each other. And so Jonathan inquires of his father, what, what has David done wrong? And, and then Saul starts accusing everybody. Saul accuses his son Jonathan, saying, Why are you protecting David? Why are you taking David's side against mine? You, you, you aren't going to have a kingdom as long as David is around. And so Jonathan asks, What has David done to deserve this? And so Saul then throws a spear at him. This <laughs> running theme here. I have a problem. Let me throw a spear at it. So Jonathan tells David this, uh, and then David leaves. It's a hard parting. They're really sad to see each other go. Um, 
as David is leaving, he stops by a local church, basically, a local place where they've done sacrifices, and he goes in and he tells the guy in charge of the, of the, the, the priest, he says, you know what, I'm on a very important mission for the king. It is so important that I had to leave immediately. I have no food. So can I take the bread that's on the altar? It's like someone walking in right now and saying, I need gas money immediately. You got any money in that plate? And the priest goes, um, okay. And then David goes, well, I need a sword too. I was, yes, I'm in charge of the armies. I, I don't have a sword. Do you have a sword? And so that's where Goliath's sword had been stashed. So he takes the, the, the bread off the altar and he grabs Goliath's sword and he runs for the hills. And uh, David becomes a guerrilla leader. I mean, that's really the best term for him. He's got a band of 400 people who are fried with Saul. Saul throws spears at problems. You'd fry a few people that way. And so 400 people have gathered around David. And David is still doing what he can to protect Israel when people invade, even as Saul is trying to have him killed. At this point, Saul becomes full-on suspicious jerk. He has the priest who gave uh, David food killed and all of his family. Saul's just making friends. And then um, Saul chases after uh, David. And so the, the, what happens this first time, Saul chases after David, and Saul steps away from the army to relieve himself, goes into a cave by himself, not a wise idea, and David is hiding there in the back with some of his men, and his men egg him on and say, you know, just go kill him. Be done with him. Kill him now. And David goes, I'm not going to kill the Lord's anointed. I'm going to sneak up on him. And he sneaks up, and he cuts a corner off his, his uh, cloak. And so when Saul goes back to his army and, and gets a little bit further down the road, David can go on top of the mountain and yell out, Hey, you're missing something. I, I didn't kill you. I could have. Stop. Please stop trying to kill me. And, and Saul has been shamed. Like the, the previous general of the armies has called out him out right there. I could have killed you. Why are you trying to kill me? And he shames Saul into going home. And so he... He goes home, goes back to the capital, and, and Saul says, David, you're, you're right, I shouldn't have tried to kill you. Why don't you come back to the capital with me? So you can throw another spear? No, I'll, he just stays out there in the wilderness, and you, you, you just go on back. And so uh, Samuel dies, David takes another wife, Abigail, a fascinating story. Uh, Saul resumes his hunt for David the next season, war season. He goes out, and uh, this time David sneaks down into the army, and while everyone's asleep, he takes the king's spear and the king's water jug, and he does the same thing. The next day, everyone's getting up and, and getting breakfast, and he hollers out from the nearest hill, Hey, you missing anything? I could have killed you. I didn't. Stop trying to kill me. And again, he, he embarrasses and shames Saul. And Saul goes, goes back home, takes his army back home. He doesn't try to get David to come back this time. And uh, David sees the pattern. Like, this is not going to work well. At this point, David takes his men and they leave. They, they leave the country. He... Um, goes over to the Philistines. Remember Goliath, he's a Philistine. So the Philistines think that David has changed sides. And so at this point, uh, David would go raiding, and he would tell the Philistine king that he has gone into Israel and, and raided Israel. What he really was, was raiding other places near Philistine, but killing everyone so there were no witnesses, and then coming back to the Philistine king and saying, look at all this stuff I took from Israel. It, it's... Don't know what to make of that, honestly. But the Philistines think he's changed sides, and so the Philistines are reinforced. They go down to, have, to go back to war with Israel. They want Israel's land, and they don't bring David because they figure he, uh, he might change sides in the heat of battle. And David returns home while the Philistines are invading. He finds that his, his uh, camp has been raided by someone else, the Amalekites, and... Um, and he has to go and get his wives, his children, all of their stuff back, all of their wealth. And so he goes and he does that, comes back. Um, the Philistines defeat Israel. They kill Jonathan, David's friend. They kill, well, Saul is wounded, and he doesn't want to die at the hands of an unwashed Philistine. Have you ever heard that used as an insult, calling someone an unwashed Philistine? 
I've heard it a few times. This is where it comes from, right? That Saul doesn't want to die at the hands of an unwashed Philistine, so he puts the sword on the ground and he falls on his own sword, which is kind of impressive because you have to get the sword wedged just right. But he falls on his own sword and he kills himself rather than die by, by the hands of the Philistines. And... Um, and so then at this point, David hears the news. An Amalekite comes to David and says to him, the king is dead, and here's his crown. And by the way, I'm the one who killed him. Reward me. And he's trying to come off as someone who has helped David instead of coming off as a grave robber, which is not exactly a good look. And David looks at him and says, you killed the, king's anoint or the, the, the king that God has anointed, and you brag about this? No, you're going to die now. And so uh, David laments uh, the death of Saul and has the guy who claims to have killed him put to death. So David goes back to Israel and he thinks, okay, David was told he was going to be king when he was like 13, 14. Now he's 28. He's been on, on the war path, so to speak, out and about for a, a decade and a half. And is he going to be king yet? Nope, because there's still a son of Saul floating around. The hard to pronounce Ishbosheth. So Ishbosheth is the son of Saul, and he has uh, Abner, the commander of Saul's armies, is backing Ishbosheth, and now begins a two year civil war in, in which it's somewhat reminiscent of the American Civil War, where all the generals had gone to West Point together and they all knew each other. This is the same thing. All the people fighting knew each other because they'd all been in the same army, now they're just taking sides between Ishbosheth and uh, David. And in this running conflict, it takes two years to unfold, gets kind of messy. Uh, at the, after two years, two followers of Ishbosheth go into his house and assassinate him. Cut off his head. Bring the head to David and say, look at us, reward us, we've just killed your enemy. To which David says, you assassinated an innocent man and you're bragging about it. You're goners. And so he has them killed, and now he's king though. At age 30, he is finally king. And so, uh, at age 30, he's now going to rule for 40 years. He conquers Jerusalem to be his capital. He defeats the Philistines twice. He tries to bring the Ark to Jerusalem. And, and as they bring the Ark up to Jerusalem, this dude named Uzzah touches the Ark to try to hold it so it doesn't fall and falls dead. And so, David's very confused by this. He goes back and he takes moving the Ark more seriously. He sacrifices before he does it. He personally leads the, 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 the Ark into Jerusalem. He, he leads it. He actually dances. He, he leads the procession and he dances. And it tell, the scripture tells us as he goes into Jerusalem, his wife, remember Saul's daughter who he got married to that he paid 100 foreskins to get married to? Uh, Mikkel is her name. Mikkel looks down on the king and thinks what he is doing is vulgar and indecent. And she tells him that. And his response is, if it was indecent, I did it for God, back off. And it tell, in the last sentence, this is the last we hear of her in all of scripture, it says, and she had no children, ever. Whew. That was an unfortunate thing for her to complain about. So there's this great celebration. The ark has arrived. David has his kingdom. He has his capital. And he says, I want to build a house for God, a temple. And God's response is, no, you don't do that for me. I'm doing that for you. I'm going to take your house, your family, and I'm going to establish it so that there will always be someone from the line of David ruling in, in Israel. And so David gives thanks for this, and he establishes his borders over the coming years. It takes... Fast forward through about three or four years right there. Uh, David fulfills his promise to, that he will take care of the family. He takes care of Jonathan's family. A fellow by the name of Mephibosheth is still around. Uh, David goes to war with the Amnonites. And he sends Joab to start the war instead of doing it himself. Now Joab is David's general. And Joab is going to be David's sort of dirty works guy. He's going to be the guy who does what might need to be done, but it might be kind of ugly, and so Joab does what he thinks has to be done. And so uh, in the next year, in the spring when kings go off to war, we read, David didn't. He stays home. He should be off leading the people. He didn't do it last year. He doesn't do it this year. And while he's at home lounging, 
he sees Bathsheba bathing, and he sends a message, and he says, bring her, and he takes her, and if that's a, that is a euphemism for rape, and, and then uh, she's pregnant, right? This happens, she's pregnant. And so David sends a message off to Joab, who's leading the army, where Bathsheba's wife is fighting, where David should be, and he sends this message off and says, send, send her husband home. And he sent, the husband comes home, and David's thinking, he'll go spend the night with his wife, and then we can say, it's his kid. It'll be great. Except the guy won't go home and spend the night with his wife because all of his friends are out in battle. He won't, be, he won't do that. Uh, he doesn't think it'd be right. And so David says, okay, that's fine. And then the next night, David gets him drunk, like gets him smashed, and he still won't go home and sleep with his wife. And so he writes a letter, gives it to the husband, says, take this back to, and go back to battle. And the letter says, Joab, take this guy, put him on the front lines, and make sure he dies. And that's what happens. Bathsheba's husband is killed. And, and, and then Bathsheba mourns his death. And then David sends for her and takes her. Right? This is not the high point in David's life. This is the point at which the prophet Nathan then shows up, looks at David and tells a story, a hypothetical story, about a guy who has everything, who takes from the guy who has almost nothing. And David gets very hot and very angry. And Nathan says, yeah, that's you. That's, that's what you did. You just took the, this guy's one wife. You, you, you took him. And, uh, and Nathan tells him, because you brought the sword to Bathsheba's family, uh, the sword's going to come to your family. And it's going to get ugly. And, and it does. Uh, Dave, David's family turns on itself. Like, we all, have, we all have stories of family fighting with itself. Just pay attention to how bad this gets, right? Because David's son, Amnon, looks at his half-sister Tamar and says, that's a good-looking woman. And so Amnon fakes being sick so that Tamar will come, get, come give him chicken soup. And while she's coming to feed him, he rapes her and then sends her away. And then Amnon, uh, and then uh, there's another brother, Absalom. Absalom's a little bit hot that his sister has been raped. And so Absalom waits two years and then kills Amnon and then runs for the hills. He runs and he gets out of Dodge and it, for three years he is out of country until David finally allows him to come back home. Now Absalom is gonna be trouble because then he starts gathering support across the kingdom and he leads a revolt. He uh, usurps the throne. David wakes up one day and is told that Absalom, his beloved son, his favorite son, has taken the throne and he has to run for his life. And so David like, throws some clothes on and runs for the hills. And he takes four or five hundred people, uh, men with him, so he has a small entourage, a small military force. And the only reason that he makes it is because he leaves one dude behind who will double cross, triple cross, double cross. He goes to the, Abs the son, Absalom, and, sa and gives him bad advice, but makes it sound really good. And he says, you know what, you don't want to chase David, because you know David... He He's, he's going to get you. You chase after him without getting, all your, getting your army together, he'll take you out. Really, David was tired and whooped, but he, he made him sound scary. And so uh, Absalom and, and David's uh, military, they, they, have, uh, they, they go to war with each other. And so we have this sort of another civil war. And David tells his commanders, don't kill Absalom. And then Joab does. Like Joab finds, Ab Absalom was very proud of his long hair and he's riding his mule along trying to get away and he gets caught in a tree by his hair. And so Absalom goes up and takes three spears and runs them through three times because he might as well make sure he's really dead. And, uh, <laughs> and so uh, the army that had fought for, and David weeps for his son and the army that had fought for David because David's now back in Jerusalem and is king again, uh, is thinking, they're, they're confused. So Joab goes to him and tells him, you better go thank the army for winning or else you're going to lose the, the support of the people. And so David does this, and, and Joab, again, is a dog. Uh, so things start to settle da down, kind of. He still has to put down another rebellion and deal with a problem with the Gibeonites, which is another story. Uh, 
And we start to wrap up at this point because David goes to defend the kingdom again and he can't fight because at this point he's almost 70 and he's told, you've got to stay home or else the light of, if you are killed, the light of Israel will go out. Um, we get into 1 Kings and at this point, Adonijah, another of David's sons, uh, tries to usurp the throne. At this point, David looks at Solomon and says, you take my mule, my donkey, you ride it in the city, I'm going to proclaim you king, and then David dies. So let's do a quick check on the life of David. Do you think he'd make a good Hallmark Channel movie? <laughs> baby right I, <laughs> when we tell when you take the christmas carol and reduce it down to uh bah humbug three ghosts merry christmas god bless us everyone like that gets rid of all the nuance in the context and the details and i don't know which story of the christmas which version of the christmas carol you watch but i'll tell you the one i watch i watch the muppets Every year, I watch the Muppet Christmas Carol, and I am man enough to admit I have shed a tear for a short green Muppet. When Tiny Tim is not there by the fire, it just it whoops me. Every year, I cry in front of my kids over Tiny Tim. And why do I do that? Because a child dies? No, it's because Tiny Tim dies, and we know the whole story of Tiny Tim, right? Some of you look at me like I'm crazy. You have got to watch some more Muppets. You all need more Muppets in your lives. Uh, <laughs> But the reason that you care is that you have the whole context of the story of Tiny Tim, right? And in the same way, for me to say that David believed in the promises that God has given him, that I, you will be king and then your, your children will follow after you, that all sounds warm and fuzzy. And then you read the story. Like, that was the whole... I have glossed over so much. Like, to read the... Please, go read the story of David. It starts in 1 Samuel 16. You just read it straight through. But if you read the story, David believes the promise, and he believes it in thick and in thin. And there was some rather thin times, weren't there? Right? David went through some rather hard times, and I think that's what makes it so real. It's... To believe in the promises of God, that God will be with us and God will walk with us, is not to say that our lives turn into the Hallmark Channel. It is to say that God walks with us through thick and the thin in the same way that God walked with David, and David went through some things. And so, thanks be to God for the promises God has made to us. Thanks be to God that we can... This, this hymn, How Firm a Foundation, like, I just want us to hear this. The soul that on Jesus still leans for repose, I will not, I will not desert to its foes. That soul, though all hell shall endeavor to shake, I'll never, no, never, no, never forsake. That's what we see in the life of David. Amen.